Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Pimble in the Machine, a podcast by Awakeners for Awakeners. So this is where we discuss what the hell just happened aspect of what might loosely be termed spiritual awakening. So let's begin. My name's Tom, and I'm here with my friend Greg. We've been talking about this stuff weekly for about 18 months now. Hi, Greg. How's it going? Hi, Tom. I'm pretty good. Um, I guess, how's it going? First of all, I, I need to apologize for uh, my outrageous use of teacher mode on the last podcast. I know the questions kind of require some kind of a, an instruction, I, I guess. But um, And I've been teaching you know, advanced hypnotherapy and stuff and corporate training for 30 years. So it becomes a default. And I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to try and soften it. I'm going to have words with myself later. Um, it's just that I get so taken with this. Uh, and I want people to get it because this is a real game changer. We're talking about serious shifting here. Um, and it's like, you know, our team, which has all the answers, is just waiting for us to show up. So um, what I guess I want to say really is the information that I'm imparting is either from my study of what might loosely be called the esoterics or what I call the download, which is usually stuff I get during a journey. Um, and I'm wanting to share that. Uh, and hopefully dismiss the teacher, you know, side of, because I'm all excited about it, but then I get it, well, you know, it's, uh, and, I, and I hate that. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, take myself out and give myself a good talking to later. So I okay. that everything is cool. Amazing. Yeah. Because we, I remember when we first started and we created a kind of a Facebook group to kind of bond the thing together, we called it guides, not gurus. That's open now. That group. Pr- yeah. Primarily for that, that was the whole principle, wasn't it? You know, yeah. um, you didn't want to be preaching at people. You just wanted to be pointing in a direction over there and say, go over there if you want. And here's what happened to me when I went over there. <laughs> yes. And now I want it to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, so, so I think firstly, every week, I really want to thank our listeners who, who've contributed with, with comments, uh, questions, um, you know, requests on, on, on classifications. Um, we're we know we're now four in, and, and we still haven't been cancelled. So no. onwards and upwards. Um, so so continuing where we left off, one one piece of feedback. Uh, talking about our experiences uh, in and around uh, in journeying, uh, we've been we've been requested to go a bit deeper on one, Greg, and and that was last week when you mentioned your dark night. Of the soul, or, or even the night of the long knives, was another yeah. name you gave it, which which intrigued me, uh, given the sort of historical reference there. So, would you just give us a little bit more on, on what on what you meant by that? Yeah, uh, well, I guess there's chaos and there's dark night of the soul chaos. So uh, sometimes you know it can feel like life isn't worth the candle that we can't cope anymore. Uh, to me, I just hit the wall. There, I, basically, I was done everything kept falling apart. I kept thinking it couldn't get worse and it did. Uh, and then you get to a point where they say there's the only way is up. Well, well, there's another way, which is out, which is where I was intending to go. But for some reason, you know, somebody up there loves me or hates me. I'm not really sure. So they, I got kind of pulled back from that. Um, it's, but it's that thing about having nowhere to go. It, it, this is chaos with an uppercase C. Um, but what I found, because I had nowhere else to go, once I wasn't going out, the other only other way was through. And um, what I came to realize, at least for myself, is that the huge chaos, particularly all chaos, but the huge one is a massive portal. And I guess uh, if you think about a film like The Matrix, you get the opening scenes, they establish the chaos of the situation, and then we encounter our reluctant hero. And, and he never wants to go through the thing, right? He always wants to avoid it, but there's no other way. And isn't that the dark night of the soul, right? It, there's nowhere else to go. So he, he faces the adversary, the adversary, and as he engages with the chaos and trusts his inner wisdom, and that's the key here, he gets creative and produces the magic. That's, that's it. And if we're sufficiently traveled, you know, preparing us for the portal, in other words, you do the journeying before the dark night of the soul arrives because it's coming at some point. We all Mm. have to go through it, I think. Um, If we're prepared, then we're linked with our guides 
and we're producing outrageous magic, which ultimately enables us to transcend, which is, you know, as far as I know, what we're here to do. So um, the dark night of the soul isn't a walk in the park. I know some people who talk about the awakening as if they were tiptoeing through the tulips. And I'm thinking, man, it's a bit like being dragged through the hedge backwards by a gorilla, at least the way that it happened to me. <laughs> and the antidote to the dark night of the soul is gnosis, which is where we were last week. And so we're bringing it around. This, this thing fits so neatly because it's exactly how it works. The gnosis begins with the highest form of learning, which is the unlearning. I think it was um, Rumi who said that learning, unlearning is the highest form of learning. And so as we look behind the facade, we begin to realize that most of the ancient wisdom, which is sorely needed at this time, has been brutally hijacked and distorted. And this keeps us enslaved in the matrix. So the dark night of the soul is actually a huge wake up call. If we're prepared for it, then it's, it's still not easy, but at least we can go straight to the team and things happen quickly and easily. Whereas when we're doing it by ourselves, and I think um, there's something later on that I want to bring this back around with as well. Um, so yeah, that's my take on the wow. dark night. That's interesting. It, and I, my, my, as soon as you thought about, you talked about that moment, I was kind of thought in, in, in a modern day language, a lot of people might refer to it as as rock bottom they they might they might even reflect back in, into their lives and, and and identify the point at which they said oh that was that was my real low because everyone in their life must have a point that is the lowest point you yes. can't you, you don't just you don't just go along complete on the you know on the plateau the whole time you and you have you'll have a number of of dips and one of those dips will be the lowest dip Yes. And I think the plateau is important also because what happens in growth is you hit a plateau and people think, oh, I've stopped growing. No, you've just paused. And then the other bit is obviously there are also peaks um, yeah. and, and the peaks are, are really exciting and the view is incredible. But you also have to come down off those peaks as well. Yes. And, and we'll sometimes to that later, too, I think, in that juxtaposition of those two. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I hope that I, I think I hope that answered the answer the sort of the question for, for for that listener. Um, I certainly get it now. Um, so let's let's we move on to an, another question. I think you had one. Uh, why don't Why don't you introduce introduce the the, the topic, Greg? Okay. Uh, right. So this this question is from a great friend of mine who wishes to remain nameless, and I thought this was a great idea. Because I wanted to say this came in from a Mrs. Trellis of North Wales, because I always wanted to do it, right? But he said, no, no, no. And he has instructed me. His instructions are that he will henceforth be known as Disgusted of Tunbridge Wells. So this question has come in from Disgusted of Tunbridge Wells, and it actually wasn't a question. It was more of a theme, but I put it in the form of a question and, and tried to keep it um, true to the uh... original. Is, is that a homage to Private Eye? I think yes. it might be. Yes. No, to, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. Oh, excellent. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so the question basically is, how do we transfer the physical and the spiritual worlds at the same time? In other words, how do we have a foot in both camps? Yeah. Uh, and this actually could be key, I think, because we're looking at the shift right now from the physical three-dimensional world into the non-physical five-dimensional world and beyond. I don't know if there's any limit to that. And I guess, um, to me, the trick to this move is the ego. This is where the leverage is. This is the monkey driving the bus. And this is the small self. Ram Dass talks about it like that. And it's so limited and alone that it locks us in fear. It judges, complains, preens, fights, confronts. It's male energy, pure male energy. And our fear is that we're separate. Through our journeying, we can unlearn that bit of information and come to the gnosis, and we unlearn by seeing beyond, which is what we were talking about a few minutes ago. We look beyond it, and we, we get a different, um, a different view. So here's, for instance, let's take male energy. Male energy is dominating. It's, um, it, the ego is male energy. That's why I'm thinking about it. It's rigid. It's like a rock, you know, thou shalt not pass. And, and the male wants to conquer the female because we're, you know, we're aggressors. Female energy is very different. It's malleable. It negotiates. It's a bit like water. 
you know, it flows. And you know what? Most of the time, water can find its way around most any rock. So the female energy submits. So the male energy attacks and, and dominates, and the female energy submits. And then the male says, aha, victory. The female is surrendering to the male dominance. And through her surrender, she conquers. It's as old as time. It's why the male um, society really has for millennia denigrated the female. You know, she's the real power. And you might check out the story of Mary Magdalene because she wasn't what they tell you she was. So as we come more to balance these energies, the male and the female within us, easily moving between the two, the head and the heart. So the head is the male, the heart is the female. We come to move more easily between the worlds, as it were. It's kind of like a balance. It's the yin and yang. It's the, it's the old story, right? You just balance the energy. And so the trick is as you find yourself, or as I find myself being judgmental, which is very easy, um, you know, complaining, whatever it is, that's that's the little me going, you know, throwing my parts, you know, my, my toys out of the pram, putting my parts on. So if I can get aware of that and just go quiet and in myself and just allow my heart to open, then things change immediately. And that's been really powerful for me. Wow. Hmm. That's that's quite something. I like the... Um... We need yeah, we need to talk about Mary Magdalene at some point. Ooh. <laughs> a future future episode. Banned from the podcast world. <laughs> so um I, I had a think about this one as well. And and maybe as it seems to be something I go to quite a bit, coming in on the, the almost a, a, a practical element to to it all. Um what I came to realize in terms of a balance between the two is that they could be quite complementary to each other. So, so for example, I, 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 um, you know, have a fairly busy life, you know, family, you know, business, all, all these things, and I know now from experience that if if there's a good sort of energy in the house and good feelings and lots of love, then I'm practically in a place where I can plan well, plan my week, plan my life, and I can and I can plan in slots for you know time to yourself for for you know, for journeying or, or meditation or whatever it might be, and I and also arriving at those places you know in really good optimal conditions you know not being interrupted, not being too stressed or tired, and then when I'm in the journey, quite often I will encounter elements that will feed back into my real life positively. You know, suddenly you come out with a sudden, a sudden concept or idea of, about how somebody has arrived at who they are and why they are like that. And, um, and you know, you should just maybe, you know, an example would be just opening up your heart to somebody and, you know, maybe not trying to fix things or, criti- you know, we're not being critical. And suddenly that relationship improves. Yeah. The energy increases in the real world and, and, it, and, and it feeds backwards and forwards. And and then what happens is if you with, with that balance is that quite often you get to the really fun stuff in the journeying that's not really about the the practical world or people or relationships, but it can sometimes be difficult to get there unless the conditions are right. Yep. So um, I spend my life yeah with a foot in each camp, just you know seesawing backwards and forwards but i'm just but i'm wary that there's a there's a balance i mean there are examples aren't there of tibetan monks that you you might argue went a little too far (laughs) one way you know and ended up starving to death yeah um and obviously it is very easy and very common to probably go too far the other way and just live 100 percent in the real world, just turning up and doing a forever to-do list. Yeah, forever to-do list. It sounds like my idea of hell. Yeah. (laughs) But it's interesting that the term real world is used to describe what the Chinese always called the world of 10,000 things. And yet, the more I experience this stuff, the more I realize that this is not the real world at all. 
this is some kind of joke. Um, and it's really made a big difference to me. I guess, uh, yeah. It's, I, I, I was think, I was actually journeying on exactly the same thing the other night when I kind of realized that our world is fairly finite. I know like they talk about like the universe being infinite and everything, but really from a practical sense, you know, we live in a, a sort of a finite reality. And, you know, you, you, you see the same things most days, you do the same things, you know, all, all that kind of, and it's, it's, a, it's a set menu, essentially. <laughs> I like it. Or you can go, yeah, or you've got this kind of all-you-can-eat infinite buffet on the other side, because essentially with the journeying aspect, the, the possibilities are literally infinite in terms of what kind of experience you could have, what you might see, what you might learn, what you might hear. Yes, it's completely unconstrained. It often has no formula or certainly not anything recognizable that you might see in the in the real world. And you can go off anywhere you want. Yeah, I I guess I was thinking about this, you know, how do you describe it to somebody? And it's really difficult. Yeah. But I thought for me, it's kind of like um, this world what's known as the real world to me is like being on a stage in a play and I'm the actor. So what happens is I step out of role. I remove my makeup and I go home. And that's what the journey is. The journey takes me home and it feels more and more like that. Yeah. I've also been having a little look at um, our own bodies sort of physiologically. So for example, in terms of the various ke uh, chemicals that we make for ourselves, you know, mm. serotonin, dopamine, DMT. And um, there are, there are hacks or, or things you can do in the real world that can create these chemicals, you know, stroking a, stroking a pet cat or a dog is, you know, is, is one way of, of doing, you know, calming chemicals. And, and actually if you, if you go through and, and 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 try your best to, to do a number of these things such that you've got a what they would consider this sort of healthy chemical balance then i think also that probably helps with the journeying oh yeah uh, and there you know because you're in you're in a, you're in a good place you're and then that's where you make the dmt yeah everything feeds off itself yeah and um the, the the DMT part is really interesting. It's where all the the huge visuals are. I think because I'm not visual, I don't get. Uh, to me, it's like going into a, a a warm soup, which is very comfortable. And then little eddies take me into different aspects of the soup. So I could be in one eddy and getting a download about something, and then something will take me another way, and I'll get something else. And what frustrates me to death is that I get some amazing downloads, and then like seconds later, I cannot remember what it was. Now it tends to come back, but it just drives me crazy. I I couldn't agree more. Sometimes I mean I'm there with my my pen and paper when I'm out and trying to trying to write stuff down, and I can feel it ebbing away as I'm writing. I've, had, I've, I've sort of written half a sentence and it's just, you know, it just tails off. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> and yet we know it, but we don't know that we know it. You're right. And it does come back. I had, I had an experience on Friday where I was talking to somebody, um, a friend of mine, and something that had come out to do with them that had popped out the week before that I had forgotten or had been wiped popped. Well, it, it came out of my mouth before I'd even realized it had popped into my head. Wow. Which goes back to the kind of the knowing bit of there wasn't, you know, there was no time to even make a decision. That thing was being said. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, you know, and I'm glad it came out and it said, because um, it was, you know, it, it felt right. It felt right. Or it felt good. Yeah. yeah, and it was all anyway. And there was a lot of love involved in it as well. Um, so, yeah. So, so for me, I wonder whether the. Do you think the the listener who who had the question wants to 
create a balance? Yes. No, knowing knowing him, yes. And is is apprehensive about getting the about not getting a, a balance that works. It, it's very true. This is the, the whole point of the thing. I think is how do we be in this world, knowing what we know of the other world as we come to know it, which in my case is extremely limited. There are people who can give you chapter and verse about pretty much anything, I think. But uh, it's it's how do we become more spiritual? I hate that word, but you know, more loving because that's the heart, and less analytical and criticizing. That's the head in our day-to-day lives, and it's a discipline. But what I find is, like you said, with the with dopamine or whatever, how one it just keeps feeding into itself. It's a beautiful uh, continuous feedback loop. So. As my intention is to go out when I journey, and I when I go, it may be to learn something or to connect with something or whatever it is, but it's always in love. Then when I come back, it's a lot easier to be in love, having been in love, if you know what I mean. So it's not like I have to try and make it up. It's easier each time I journey to be more of that in my day to day, I hope, unless I'm teaching and then, you know, it's Mr. Lecture. <laughs> well, I don't know, because I mean, I, again, I mean, obviously, not coincidence because we've been talking about this sort of stuff before, but I that popped out for me three days ago exactly the same when I was thinking about the question was just the word the word love came back in terms of that's how you that's how you balance it you you yeah. you, you you go in both ways with love and it, it, I feel like it it just almost naturally comes together to a to a balance that works for you. Yeah, love is the fusion, and then the magic happens. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, wow. Okay, so I think we're probably close to to wrapping up this week. There's something we talked about earlier, Greg, about well, in terms of what we were going to talk about maybe next week. What were you What were you thinking? Well, we've had some feedback about it would be nice if we told our individual stories about how we actually came to do it and do it. You know, what is the actual process that we yes. use? And not that it's one that anyone else should use, but what do we do to get to where we would like to go? Okay, so like, an, like a physical description. So what, what I'll do next this week is when I'm at, I'll really make an effort to notice exactly what I'm like, the steps that I'm doing both physically and mentally. And, uh, and we can see where we can say we, where we go from there. Fantastic. Excellent stuff. Okay. So as I said, I think that's all we've got time for this week on pinball in the machine. And I do hope that you uh, enjoyed it. Just to reiterate, we really want to hear from you. Uh, so you can email us at hello in pinballinthemachine.com or you can visit our, the Facebook page of the, of the production group behind it, Guides Not Gurus. So from myself, Tom, it's goodbye. And from my friend, Greg, it's goodbye. See you next week, guys. <laughs>